And I've got a chapter in the book about the broke millionaire. Mm -hmm. And this person, no matter how much more they make, they just spend to that limit. So it's not always about how much you make. I have seen people with very low salaries acquire or, or build, you know, a nice um, portfolio over time and have nothing to worry about. So it's what we save. It's what we spend. It's what we earn on our money. Your relationship with money matters. I'm Michelle Perkins, and this is the Money and You podcast, where I will be breaking down your relationship with money, offering tough love money tips, and a money dating plan that will focus on lifting the barriers to success to help pave the way for better money practices and increased wealth. It's time to take control to live a limit-free life. It starts today. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Money and You Show. I'm Michelle Perkins, your host. Super excited about today's show. Um, I, I love my guests, typically all of them, but today is really special because this particular guest um, really gets it, this idea of your relationship with money and um, writes about it, speaks about it, uses it in her practice. And she's really, like I have to say, the perfect guest for this show. So without further ado, you are going to love this conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Amy Cook. So please welcome Amy Cook, founder and financial advisor at Maven Lane Financial Group. Amy's career spans over 20 years in financial services, transitioning to financial advising in 2009. She's the author of the Amazon bestseller, Your Money Narrative, which delves into how personal experiences shape financial behaviors and decisions. As Amy worked on her own money narrative, she helped her clients do the same with a mission to build lasting legacies through effective financial decision-making and strategies. Welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. So we spoke a little bit and I was just, you know, so tickled that you're, what you're talking about is exactly what I feel like people need to hear. So, um, you know, I think this is going to be a great conversation because we're going to talk about exactly what this show is designed to help people understand. It's about your relationship with money, your thoughts, beliefs, feelings, how they impact your decision making. Tell us um, a bit about how you decided that this would be a big part of, you know, how you help people. Yeah. So, you know, I've been in the business for about 15 years now and over the years, um, you know, I just noticed that, you know, there were repetitive stories that I would hear, you know, over and over again. And as I kind of listened to other people's stories, I started diving into my own story and, and questioning some things like why, why do I keep doing this over and over? Um, and as I did that, I learned a lot about myself um, and I was able to grow from it and make, you know, positive changes. So it just sort of evolved over time to write about it. And I find that most of my clients that I've worked with, you know, they don't really want to get into the granular detail about financial terms. They just want to understand. And I, I feel that stories is a great way to relate and um, find commonality and, and, you know, learn from others' mistakes and or, you know, others, uh, you know, wins and then grow from there. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, we talk a lot on this show about uh, the ideas and beliefs that come from our childhood and how they sort of, you know, linger around in our subconscious mind and show up when we're making adult decisions later. And um, can you speak a little to how your childhood impacted some of your money ideas and beliefs? Yeah, absolutely. So the story I write about myself in the first chapter and, um, you know, being the youngest of five, uh, my parents uh, went through some hard financial times when I was, uh, you know, six, seven years old and they, and we lost our house. Um, 
I remember as a little girl just seeing it being all about money. And of course it was because we wouldn't have lost our house if we had had more money. But in my little brain, you know, I didn't understand how much money we were talking about, uh, what would have solved the problem. I didn't know if there were financial habits in place that could have changed the direction of things. So I just saw the emotion around the stress with my parents, my dad, and I thought, well, I don't want to ever feel like that. So the solution is to make money. So I spent a good chunk of my life just trying to run around in circles and, and stack my coins and my and my bills so that I would never have to feel that way. But obviously, looking back, it's there's so much more to it than that. Um, but it's a good example of how it formed a narrative and, you know, and it served me in some ways, you know, as soon as I could get someone to give me a job or a buck to do something, be it, a, you know, starting my own babysitter's club or, you know, running around with paper routes and stuff like that. I, I jumped on those opportunities, but it was, but a lot of it was, was based out of fear. And I don't know that that was the healthiest way to go about managing that. Yeah, thank you. I I know I even, you know, I look at my own kids and they're only three years apart, but different things were going on when each one was young. And for my daughter, I think there's a little more financial upheaval, but we've just done a a big switch and sold a business and started, my husband started something new and there was a lot going on in that moment. Um, And you think your kids, you know, I, I, I guess we tell ourselves this because we you know, it makes us feel better. But we think they're oblivious or we think they're not paying attention kind of to not just the words, the energy. I mean, they can feel stress, even if you never say I'm stressed. So Mm -hmm. I'm really curious. um, You know, I I know you've raised a couple of kids. I mean, for for people listening, because even even when I hear this, I, I have to go in my head and think, oh, my gosh, what what have I said recently that might impact, you know, a child? And I think we, you know, I've had parents kind of freak out going, oh, my gosh, you know, I've, I've said these things around my kids. What do you think is some, I don't know if you expected parenting advice on the show, but <laughs> I'm asking anyway, any thoughts on, on how parents, I don't know, can navigate this a little bit? I do have thoughts on that. And I, and I think that anyone that's listening, to, you know, to your show is obviously interested in, you know, you know, self-improvement and, you know, making things better, right? But there's a lot of households where people have, you know, so many issues around money, talking about money, good feelings, bad feelings, you know, negative, positive or whatever. It's it's tough because that then, you know, goes to your kids. If you don't have a positive relationship with money or or, you know, emotions around it and putting it in its place in that it's just money. Um, It's really hard to then raise your kids uh, in a, in a money positive way. So, I mean, I was a single mom for many years and I know I screwed my kids up. I mean, I was always just kind of lecturing and lessons and, and tidbits and things and, and, thinking that that was the right thing to do. And obviously not always, because sometimes, you know, kids don't need that or want to hear that. But I think talking about it is really good and, and not talking about money and just having stressful things going on and not addressing it in any way mm-hmm. when we both know that they know something's going on is, is part of the problem. And if, you know, parents sat down and just said, look, we got this going on. It is what it is. We're going to get through it and make that a non-emotional event. Mm -hmm. Then maybe those attachments wouldn't form in an unhealthy way. But, you know, I don't have a crystal ball and I am, (laughs) I don't have a degree in psychology. I mean, but I, you know, just observing my own, my own patterns. Yeah, and as you're saying that, I think I have had somebody with a degree in psychology, and I think she said the same thing. I, I don't ask that question often, but I did ask her, and um, yeah, I think she gave a very similar answer. So I think <laughs> you, you're very spot on. 
Um, and I, I think, yeah, it's not not talking about it. That's a problem when we never talk about it. Um, and it's not even talking about it realistically, as long as, like you say, I, I think there's not this uh, very strong emotion around it, because where does that lead? If, if, if kids start connecting the dots and they think that money creates, you know, just some devastating emotional impacts, you know, what, what is, how does that play out in the future? And it can't, you know, and, and I have to say, you know, my, my dad specifically, he was a breadwinner. He did talk about it, but it was, it was very black and white. It was like, we're broke. Mm. Well, what does that mean? You know, we can do this this week. We, we can't afford to do it. it, it everything was just, just one or, you know, over here or over here. And there wasn't, it didn't feel like there was a lot of in between. So you kind of run around and then, you know, as kids, I know in my household, like if I started asking a bunch of questions about things that were none of my business, I got in trouble. So, you know, I had to kind of, kind of just accept the answers that I, that I received. So I think that there's a healthy balance. And I also think that there's things that, you know, maybe patterns, habits, decisions that, that, you know, would have, would have to change on the other side. And, and we sort of pass these things along generation to generation and you know if we're not equipped with the tools to do things differently then then how you know how do how do we how do we change it you know so the key is really just some education around you know basic planning and it's it's really sad that we don't have that in our high schools yeah um because we all have to deal with our money mm -hmm. but i mean that's you know we we can't we can delegate pieces of that out but ultimately we have to be we have to have a hold on it yeah, that's a great point. And, and you're right about high school, because the next thing you know, kids are in college. And I, I've had several guests on the show talking about how that's, <laughs> that's when it all went down, because, you know, they got talked into credit cards they shouldn't have had and things like that and didn't know how to use them and got themselves in a lot of debt, had to, you know, spend years pulling themselves out to get back to some just level footing so they could continue on. Um, so if you had some information in high school, it, it sounds young, but it's not because, you know, it, it's funny how we make this leap from uh, as soon as you're in college, you have access to all of these things um, and you probably have a, a job or something. And then when you're out of college, that's even weirder because then you're expected to be an adult and you've got the degrees, you get the job, you're making an actual salary and you have no idea really what to do with that <laughs> so right right i mean i think it could start even earlier than high school yeah. myself but yeah. i mean you look at just yeah the credit cards like you said and and you know the number of these kids that have no idea how the interest even works mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they don't realize when they're paying those minimum payments that they're not that that's just money they're just giving away they're just flushing down the toilet you know to pay for things that they probably don't even remember buying. Yeah, um, it, it's it, and and they are bombarded with offers that they can take. You know, regardless of whether they have the ability to pay it back. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there, there's a lot out there. I mean, it's not surprising that as a country, you know, financially, well, as a country financially, we're not doing that great either. Um, mm -hmm. But just you know statistically speaking, that there's so many problems from a personal finance standpoint. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so how, you know, what were you doing before you became uh, a, a wealth advisor? What, uh, how did that transition happen? Yeah, so I've been in this business for 15 years. Prior to that, I was in the mortgage business. And that's really when I decided to shift over, um, I was uh, in the mortgage business before the the bust, and I I really I just felt like I was dealing with my clients on a reactive basis. Um, you know, they would take money out, and then a year later, you know, you wipe everything clean, you pay off the credit cards, you pay off the you know the debt, and it would come back. And so it became very clear that it was a habit 
versus just a single catastrophe over, mm-hmm. you know, losing a job or, you know, a short term problem. And, and I, and then at that time, my father passed away and I was able to see all of these loose ends, um, in his picture and, mm-hmm. and dealing with my mom through all of that. It was like simple stuff that could have been fixed pretty easily and would have created a much more peaceful, um, you know, right. dealing with the grief and everything else, just not dealing with some, some very basic things would have been, you know, better for everyone. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, he didn't know. He didn't, you you don't know what you don't know. And so I really wanted to get on the other side of it and be proactive and say, hey, you know, you could put X, Y, and Z in place and you don't have to worry about this worst, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a worst case scenario, but it's not. Eventually we're all going to die. I mean, death and taxes is certain (laughs) for all of us. We don't know when, um, but, you know, putting some basic things in place can really make life a lot easier for your loved ones when you do pass. And I think that that's really an amazing legacy to leave. And it's not just for people who have a lot of money. It's Mm -hmm. for everyone. And if you have minor children, it's especially important to make sure that you have things laid out so that the people that you want caring for your kids are caring for your kids. Yeah. Yeah, I, that is a topic that um, I could talk all day about as well. And uh, yeah, I, tr- I do try to uh, have people on discussing this because, uh, you know, I had a whole separate new financial education when my parents passed. And my parents were fairly sophisticated um, uh, on that stuff. And yet there were still things that it would have been much, it could have been much easier. So it's really really good to understand that and to have an advisor actually one of the best tips i got was from their financial advisor um, when i was just my dad actually before he passed had introduced me to her and we met a few times that you know uh, so because he really wanted me to get to know her and and understand their situation um and yeah, she she warned me about some things that I would have never guessed, like bank accounts freezing your their funds and things like that. And she, she was just very, not only was she knowledgeable, but she really understood what I was trying to do and, and where I was in the process and was, was giving me some excellent help. Uh, so I, I think that's I, such an amazing gift that for your dad to do that. Mm-hmm. I I have so many clients that are multi-generation and I always encourage people, you know, bring your kids in well before anything's wrong. You, you know, you're healthy, you're fine, and that's the time to do it. Um, but a lot of people don't don't do that, you know. And, and for a lot of us, it's hard to say, oh, if I start talking about this stuff, it means something's going to happen. And I always kind of joke with people, hey, if you buy the life insurance, it means you're not going to die because <laughs> the insurance company always wins, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but. It just there's just a peace of mind and knowing, you know, if if you're panicking and you say, hey, come meet the financial advisor mm-hmm. and just call him or her if anything happens. I mean, what what a gift. Yeah, I have to give him, uh, you know, a lot of credit for that. He he really was concerned with that. And and frankly, thank goodness that he did that because there was so much. I had to do just to be able to look at things, to talk to her about specifics, you know, and fortunately we had a little window of time there where I could get all the paperwork in order and I could be on the accounts and, you know, things that uh, I needed to have. So um, I probably wouldn't have known any of that. And it was nice to get some of those things done, um, you know, when you could, because like you said, you really don't want to be spending all this time on financial details when you want to be spending time with your people, you know, when they're ill or whatever. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a really, there's so much to learn there. And I was, I will forever be grateful to the financial advisor who helped me through that process. And she was very compassionate and, and also, you know, just really helped me understand things. So um, yeah, you, you, you have a huge role in people's lives. And, you know, I don't think everybody 
kind of accesses the help that you provide in the same way, but the people who who do see you as, um, you know, a partner in their life and somebody that they can ask all kinds of questions of, you know, I mean, with limits, <laughs> but still. Um, I don't know. Sometimes there's no <laughs> limits. I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here if they need me. But yeah, I mean, and especially during crisis, it's really important to have a strong team, um, you know, just kind of in your financial court, if you will. Mm hmm. Yes. So if we circle back to this idea of, you know, beliefs and, and how they impact your financial decisions, um, you've written this fabulous book about, uh, and it, I, I love the angle you took with the narratives, the, this, these sort of uh, fictional stories that help people to understand very specific uh, financial situations. Um, and, and, you know, kind of how regular people are going to address them and some of the things that maybe they're not thinking about. It, it's just so cleverly done. I, I loved it. Oh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. and it uh, really illustrates things in a way that I think most people can't see from just having it described. Do you want to just kind of give us a, a sample of what I'm talking about? Yeah, so, I mean, the book is really just a group of, fictional stories loosely based on common stories, you know, and common dilemmas that, you know, you may or may not go through during your lifetime. But it's, you know, sending kids off to college, kids getting jobs, divorce, uh, death, uh, but or buying a second home, um, inheriting money. Yeah. There's just a lot of different topics. And, you know, I, I tried to make them, you know, just regular people that, that I mean, because I work with regular people. So <laughs> it may not be a story that you relate to for yourself, but maybe your sister or your neighbor or your uncle. Um, and then it, it, the first half of the chapters is the story. And then the second half is me just kind of weighing in a little bit with some things to think about. Um, regarding just the dilemma that they face. And then I also created worksheets for a lot of the chapters and a lot of things that, that again, you may or may not go through, but checklists of things to think about when you're in the middle of a job change or divorce or, you know, death and, and those types of things, just so, you know, just something to kind of move along and check the boxes. Because a lot of times when those things are happening, we sort of paralyze and our brains are going a million miles an hour and it's hard to really hone in on the action steps and mm -hmm. kind of what do I do first? Um, so that's really where I come in and, and, you know, the clients that I work with, how I help them, but also just, you know, the book I think um, is hopefully a good starting point for that too. Yeah, it's great. And, and uh, you know, the one that's freshest in my mind is the one with the two couples who go on vacation with their families. They've known each other forever. And they're in this, you know, rental house. And they're like, wow, you know, we should buy one of these together. And I've had this exact conversation, which is probably why I love this one with people. And, um, you know, you're so excited and you, you can think of all the positives in this and you're kind of envisioning all these wonderful times you're going to have there. And then you, I, this is what happened to me, then you go home, you start thinking about it, and then you, all these unanswered questions. Well, you know, what if one of them loses a job or wants to sell before we do, you know, there, and you brought all of these things up and, and plus many, many more, and you realize this is way more complicated than, you know, you might initially think. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, and it's not that it's for, I don't want to be like the downer of the, <laughs> of the you know, the kill toy of years or somebody's got a great idea and I'm like, bam, bam, bam. Here's it. But it's just, it's good to just kind of know what you're up against and, and have you thought about this? And, you know, it, it's like insurance, right? We insure against catastrophic events with certain types of insurance, you know, like our car insurance, and our home insurance and all that. And, and the same can, you know, goes into these decisions where one decision like that, that just seems, you know, nice enough can really, really upset the card. And as you get older, you, you know, those things can really damper your goals and your plans. Um, 
So it's not to say don't do the, these things, but if you do, just make sure that you're going in there eyes wide open and covering your bases as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's hard sometimes for, you know, I mean, you need an outside expert like yourself to come in and remind you of the different things that you need to think about. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's very helpful. And it doesn't mean you, uh, you know, I mean, I agree. It doesn't mean you don't do it, but you, you know, you, it's a good idea to put it all in writing and make decisions ahead of time. I mean, it's no different than putting your trust together or whatever. I mean, you're trying to make decisions so that if something does happen, you're not just sitting there going, wow, what are we going to do? Like it's, it's already been thought about. So. Uh, yeah. Because recollection, you know, when something's already <laughs> happened, um, and then you say, oh, but you said this, mm -hmm. you said that. And then, no, I didn't say that. You know, it's, gosh, isn't it just nice to have something written down up front so there's just no debate? I mean, it can, it, it can tear apart families, marriages, friendships. Yeah. I, and yeah. that alone is not is not worth it. But, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, oh, no, we're close. And it's like it's some sort of an insult to, to put it into a contract or writing. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I disagree. It's I think it's actually a gift. Um, to do that because we all sort of remember bits and pieces of our stories. And if you just think about having siblings or, you know, and thinking about a childhood memory and like, for instance, what I talked about, you know, with losing the house and all of that, it, what my, my siblings that were in the house at the same time kind of went with the flow, you know, they, <laughs> they didn't have the same hangups that I did. So we all sort of process things differently. Right. Right. Absolutely. Everybody's perspective is different. It's coming from, you know, their own set of, of ideas. And um, and that's very true when you partner up with people. For example, you know, if you if you decide to go in with other people and buying a house, I mean, you really can't until, you know, something hits the fan. You don't really know how you'd react and you don't definitely don't know how they'd react. But um, but you can be unfortunately surprised. And I see that, too with people, you know, I'm sort of at that age where a lot of people are losing parents and there's a lot of drama around the, you know, the distribution of assets and all of that kind of stuff. And um, you do see families, you know, who are very close, really suffering. Um, and it's, I think it takes everybody by surprise. It's just very odd how, how much these things do impact relationships. Um, I know it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. the money can money money can do some some interesting things to to people. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, I see these you know states settle out with ease and everyone gets along wonderfully, and then you see other situations where it's the complete opposite, and it's just it's so hard to predict that. Mm -hmm. I you just you just don't know. That's why if everything is just written down and crystal clear. There's really nothing to fight about. Plus, right. An inheritance is a gift anyways. Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree that it's a gift. <laughs> so um, so as far as these narratives, did you start to recognize some either narratives within yourself or do you just hear them with clients? I mean, are there some common things that you run into that you feel are kind of barriers? Like if you keep up that story, we're not going to get where we need to go. I mean, does that... Well, you know, the narrative, it's its an interest. I mean, so a lot of people really aren't open to acknowledging a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and some are. And so it's tricky cause, because if I, you know, just sit down and start saying, where's this coming from? You know, <laughs> this, this story. And but I so I have to, you know, I, I pick up on things. I hear things and. And again, most of them are pretty common. Think, you know, they're, they're they happen over and over again, and they're kind. Of, and usually, it with spouses and partners, we marry and we connect with opposites, right? Mm -hmm. So you you get you know two completely different uh, stories that are coming together and finding a happy medium. 
But I think kind of acknowledging it and challenging some of it is is the only way to start to you know make some progress. So we can nudge. I can nudge a little bit. Well, you know why? You know what? You know why do you think that the stock market's going to drop to zero? <laughs> and then if sometimes you know making a joke out of it can can make it a little bit lighter, like you know, every company would have to go out of business for that to happen. And we'd have much, much bigger problems. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's just kind of, you know, inching, inching in a positive direction or, you know, people that I see that have so much money that they'll never spend and they're afraid to buy a new microwave, you know? So there's, yeah. there's just, you know, there's just so many different things. And, and, it, and a lot of it is generational too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, that's a great point. Because just because, you know, I think people have it in their head that, well, even you talked about it as a kid, you know, if I just, if I just have a lot of money, all the problems go away. But then people who do have a whole lot of money find that that is not I mean, some problems go away, but there's mm -hmm. still problems, maybe different problems, maybe other problems that don't go away. Um, so it, and again, it just kind of comes down to your thinking. I mean, if if you have plenty of money and you're afraid to buy a microwave, that's oh, somewhat irrational. That's some habitual thing that's going on. Um, and, you know, how do you, how, how do you talk to both? How do you talk to the people who don't have very much, so they're afraid? And then how do you talk to the people who have plenty and they're afraid? I think that, you know, it just depends. Um, I encourage people who have plenty and are afraid to live a little. And sometimes they just simply don't. Um, the habits are so deep and so in there that they just, you know, won't do it. But then on the flip side of what you were saying a couple of minutes ago, I mean, I've got a chapter in the book about the broke millionaire and, mm -hmm. and this person, no matter how much more they make, they just spend to that limit. So it's not always about how much you make. I, have seen people with very low salaries acquire or, or build, you know, a nice um, portfolio over time and have nothing to worry about. So it's what we save, it's what we spend, it's what we earn on our money. Uh, so there's multiple factors, but then if people are spending way too much and they want to retire, ideally they come in or they go to see an advisor while well, there's still a lot of time. But if they go in a couple of years before, then, you know, there's not a whole lot that you can do other than continue to work or spend a lot less. Mm -hmm. So the options are always better. And there's far more ways to improve on the situation that when we have a longer stretch of time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that's a really important point. And so when do you encourage people to, you know, get that, get the kind of help that you provide? What's a good age? Oh, gosh, you know, right out of, out of high school. But <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I occasionally get calls from people that are just about to graduate from college. And a lot of my clients will send their kids to talk to me, which I'm just so in awe when I have those conversations. And they may not need a financial advisor per se, but a lot of times like a good conversation mm. uh, can really get them off on the right foot. And I, and I've got chapters on that because, you know, there are some things to do just getting started, building your emergency fund, getting rid of the debt, um, basics that, that you can put in place. So I, I think that, you know, once that's in place, it's, it's a good idea to get some counsel or have some counsel and, it may be that you don't need a full fledged, you know, advisor relationship until you're a little older, but there's always, you know, positives that will come out of some sort of financial education kind of in your midst, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, listening to podcasts or reading a book, you know, every year, just to kind of keep yourself on the right track. And if you find that you just aren't making the decisions that you that you feel you should or that you know you should on your own, coaching is also an excellent, excellent solution alternative. Um, 
when you just know yourself and you need that accountability. And I think we all need some accountability. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that because I was just going to go there because even when you kind of know what to do, I mean, a lot of us know what to do. Um, I mean, that was a big part of my problem. I, I knew the, you know, I knew what to do. I understood financial matters, but I wasn't doing the things that I needed to do. So there's, mm -hmm. there's this gap there that you, you have to uh, solve. And so it's our, own, it's our own blinders. I have another advisor do my plan. Yeah, because okay. it, it, I mean, I can do my plan, right? <laughs> yeah. But I but I want to see what they see. Mm -hmm. Because we we look at our own our own stuff and we we just you know sometimes don't see it with a crystal clear lens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's another probably a story that people tell themselves is you know whatever your plan is, uh, I can't do that. But, you know, I mean, I can't save that much money or I can't pull that much out of my paycheck or whatever it is. Um, do you have? conversations about how they can shift that idea? I do. It's, it's not a zero. So if, if, you know, if I talk to someone who wants to buy this house in 24 months, and it's like, well, you're gonna have to save $5,000 a month, let's say just, you know, throw a number out there. I said, well, that's impossible. Well, okay, so what do we do? Save zero? <laughs> because then we're not going to we're not going to go anywhere. So then it's a you know you got to look at it, come up with something that you feel you can do, and then you slowly kind of move it up as you get comfortable. And I think we all you know amaze our 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 own selves at what we're capable of once we get the momentum and get in the mindset to make some changes and shift things in the right direction. If I have a list of 15 action steps for someone, I don't expect them to do it all the next day. We attack a couple at a time and try ideally to attack the, the most pressing ones first. And that's a win. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if some things get don't happen, the first, it, you know, in year one, we still got those three or two or three things done and we try to attack two or three more. Yeah, thank you for that. That is. Um... That's a very good answer. And I, I feel like people sometimes are afraid to talk to advisors because they think the ask is just going to be just more than they can do. And so they'd rather just not even go and, you know, feel inadequate not doing it. Um, so I love that, you know, you, you find some place where they can start and prioritize things. Um, yeah, they I think that they ask, they think that a lot of, and maybe and I, every advisor is different, but that they're going to rip apart the budget and the spending and go, okay, you're done with this. You're not getting your nails done. You're not getting your hair done. You're not doing anything <laughs> yeah. you like doing. No more vacations. And, and I always tell people like that, I'm not going to do that. You, you are telling me your goals. I'm going to tell you how much money we need and we got to find it, but it's up to you to say, this is more important than this because mm -hmm. for me i'm gonna get my hair done <laughs> and i know for for a lot of people you know it might be something else but no i give up a lot of things like i gotta i gotta get that hair done so it, it's different for everyone but if you know hey this is how much i'm short where am i going to find it um you have control so it's it's not just this you know hammer that's dropped and like X's and red all through your budget, you can never go out to eat again. I think that that's one of the misconceptions about advisors. Yeah, I, I think so too. Or they're just going to, you know, give you numbers. And, and I think maybe it used to be a little more like this, honestly, um, where people would, you know, you tell them your goals, they'd figure out how much you needed. And, you know, you couldn't see a way to do it. And they wouldn't necessarily help you to find that way, I think, early on. Um, and they just kind of be like, well, then you'll never put your kids through four years of college, you know, unless you do this. They're not going for four years. You know, I mean, there was this, it was a little mm -hmm. more black and white. I feel like advisors like you um, just have a better understanding of people and psychology and emotions and, and how those things intersect with with your financial plans and so that you can make it happen uh, more easily for people or at least with less 
um, I don't know, making people feel inadequate or, you know. We're all just people, but I think part of that is that you have a lot of people that really aren't financial planners. They're they're investment advisors Mm -hmm. and investments are a piece of, you know, what I do too, but the financial planning is where we get the roadmap, where we see the gaps. And if you don't actually engage with a planner that really truly does real planning, not Mm -hmm. here's what you need and, you know, here's the gap, good luck, but I'll invest your money for you type thing. Right. Because the plan will expose those gaps. And then there's a conversation because it's all of the different pieces. So a lot of times you can pick up some of that money and some of the other areas that haven't been reviewed. Um, but without that kind of holistic macro picture of your finance, you know, financial life, it's, it's really hard to do that. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And honestly, I'm not so sure that's been brought up before, but there is a difference between, you know, somebody helping you invest your money and somebody doing a financial plan. And that's not always the same person. And sometimes it is, but, you know, they're two different things and you and they're two different conversations. So absolutely, people should have, you know, know that. So that's a great point. And um yeah. So do you start with the financial plan? Makes sense to me. Ideally. That you would. Yeah. Ideally. Okay. Um, you know, but it's also a relationship back and forth with the plan. So if someone comes to me and they've got a really pressing issue or a need or, you know, issue, they might not want to start with pulling together all of their financial pieces. It's kind of like doing your taxes or yeah. state plan. You, you've got to pull together a lot of information. So it, it really, the, the timing has to be there because it, there's some work involved um, on the client side too. Mm-hmm. So, but ideally we start with the plan because then we know exactly where we stand and it's not a, a static result because life changes, it's mm-hmm. dynamic and the plan will change. Mm-hmm. But at least we get a good idea of where we're at now And then we, you know, shift some things and then we shift them again if we need to. So we just kind of keep going. But it really is an engagement. So I just like to do planning with people who are ready for it and Mm -hmm. understand that there's, you know, a mutual commitment there. Yeah. Thank you. And um, so just say we're running out of time, but I have a couple more questions. So, you know, as far as these stories that people tell themselves, um, what, you know, do you have an example maybe of something where a story was costing that person, uh, you know, a, a fair amount of, um, uh, kind of being, you know, it was, it was showing up as something detrimental to their financial plan or their financial well being. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, there's so many stories that can be detrimental to our financial well-being. Um, uh, What's a good example? Just to, I mean, college planning and, Mm. and, uh, you know, maybe your parents paid for an Ivy League education. And so you feel it is your obligation to do the same for your kids. But maybe you're a teacher and uh, you know, the, the income isn't there. If that person then goes and runs themselves ragged into debt to, to do that obligatory, you know, thing that's part of their story, you know, it can really, really screw things up in retirement. So, I mean, that's just, just a one idea thought or something that seems to come up a lot. Yeah, it's a great example. A uh, very good example. And I think when it comes to our kids, Sometimes we 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 do have stories that kind of prompt us to overspend and you know create some problems for ourselves. Actually, um, always and, the emotions. There's yeah. there's you know guilt underlying. We, those are the things that we really need to address because it's not about the money. Mm-hmm. It's about those those underlying pieces that are driving it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And and when you meet with people, do you tell them that that's, do you just sort of listen and hear things and interject some things or, or do you give them the, that awareness as well, that some of your 
emotions and, and thoughts around money are, are going to have an influence on for the financial plan. I would imagine some people's financial plans, they kind of think too small as well. Uh, I don't know. You can tell me. But. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I try. I mean, I, I've been shut down a number of times over the years. I get like, no, 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 I'm good. Let's move on. Um, and, and I've just got, I've been so lucky. Like my clients are just amazing. And, you know, they were really like, that was, the, if I sent books to all my clients, that was like the first thing I did before it came out of them and mine. So their feedback was really, really important to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just depends. I mean, if it's like anything else, if, if someone is, is in a place where they want to grow and they, and you see something that's glaring, they, they're, they may be in a good place to receive it. And then sometimes people are just not ready for it, you know? And, and I've been there so many times where it's like, I know in, inside of myself what's going on with something, but I don't really want someone else to say it to me. I'm just not ready for it. So there's that balance. Yeah. Well, that's even more insightful. So that's great that you can see that. Um, I really want people to be able to access your book. It has, it's so worthwhile and it's, um, it's such a, it's kind of entertaining. And, you know, I love a money book that is fun to read. Um, there's, Yay, that's, that's, <laughs> it's just so great. <laughs> so, and helpful. Does that even exist? Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> So can you help people, um, you know, understand how to contact you, how to access the book? Yeah, so the book, the book's on Amazon. I've got, there's Audible, Kindle, you know, the hardcover. Uh, there's a website, yourmoneynarrative.com, uh, where you can download a couple, I, I, the checklist, a couple of them you can download for free on the site. Um, and then my office website is, uh, mavenlanefinancialgroup.com. And uh, I've got financial planning packages there, different tiers to kind of meet people at different places in their journey. Um, and, you know, happy to chat if there, if, if, you know, there's an opportunity to uh, possibly work together. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for spending your time with me here today. I, I love this conversation. I hope it got people thinking and, uh, and especially, you know, ready to start working on a financial plan and whatever comes after that. So yeah, thank you, Michelle. This was actually really, really fun. And I, I can tell we're, we're on the same page with this stuff. So yeah. I appreciate it. So fun talk. Yeah, I, I, I love this conversation. And I feel like it's what's it's a big part of what's missing in the financial world are these conversations because once you understand this, to me, this is all foundational. And then mm -hmm. you can get ready to get wealthy. So mm -hmm. anyway, thank you again. And um, yeah, look forward to connecting with you in the future. And uh, yeah, I wish you a lot of luck with the book. Thank you. And thank you, Money and You audience. We love having you listen to the show. If you liked the show, please share, connect with Amy, get her book, and uh, give us a rating and a review if you're so inclined. And we will see you next week.